All right, Nicholas Kristoff, thank you so much. I appreciate it as always you uh, you making time to talk to us about uh, about your home here and everything that you've been witnessing. Give us give me your first kind of take on where we stand now in the clashes you've seen in the city of Portland. Well, look, um, I mean, I, I love this city. It is my home, but I I am to some degree an outsider. I think a lot of Portlanders will have a better uh, sense of the challenges than than I do. But, you know, I, I must say that I think the rest of the country is looking at what is happening in Portland and is to some degree um, getting a false impression that the entire city is going up in flames. And I don't think that this is fundamentally about federal forces being brought in to create peace. I think this is federal forces being brought in by the Trump administration to distract from the previous narrative, which was all about COVID-19 and which is one that is very damaging to the president's reelection, and rather to create one about chaos in the streets and a law and order campaign that to some degree, uh, I think, recalls the 1968 Richard Nixon campaign. So I think that's what's going on here. I don't think it's about, you know, uh, trying to protect a courthouse. I don't think it's about trying to create order in the streets. I think it's about a, I think it's a political ploy. Now, I'm going to make a a statement that's going to generalize some things here, and I I don't mean to do that, but I do want to uh, say that based on some of the the people I've spoken to, there seemed to be a correlation between people who support President Trump in general and people who support federal action against violent protesters, or at least are very heavily against some of the violent action we have seen from protesters um, that was happening on a much smaller scale than we're seeing now after the federal involvement, but before the feds showed up, couldn't this also be yeah. looked at in a way as just Donald Trump doing what his supporters want him to do and back up kind of the rhetoric he has used for cases like this since running for president? Well, I mean, I guess I would make the point that in general, the Republican Party has not been the party that's advocated federal intervention in local politics. It's been more the opposite. And and I mean, I think there's some inconsistency on both sides. Uh, you know, in central Oregon a few years ago, when you had conservative ranchers take over federal property, then it was uh, liberals who were deeply upset about that. But at the end of the day, look, if one cares about order in downtown Portland, as I do, if you are upset about uh, about breaches of federal property, then what has happened with federal forces being sent in is the last thing you want. This has made the problem worse. The, those federal troops, I mean, I, I don't know what else to call them, but troops, uh, when you have he- heavily militarized forces that come in like that, you know, they have not established order. They've established greater chaos. And so wherever one is on the political spectrum, whatever one thinks about the need for order in Portland, this has not achieved that. I know there were different viewpoints, as you mentioned earlier, whether based on where you are viewing this from. If you are living in the city of Portland, if you are living in Oregon or closely in neighboring Washington, you have a certain level of kind of understanding of what's going on. And there are a, a different set of Uh, of topics that you are considering, I think, when you're focused in on the protests and the federal involvement in them. Then you have the national and international eyes looking at Portland as well. How do you think what is happening here is impacting the world, both on a Portland level and then on a national level, as people continue to watch how this all plays out? I think that there is something of a false narrative that Portland is, uh, in Sean Hannity's words, something like a war zone um, and that it's exceedingly dangerous downtown. I mean, in fact, uh, you know, when I when I've been covering the protests, I mean, I, I have been a little bit nervous about some of the protesters who pull off their masks to shout slogans. That is not good COVID-19 awareness. But in general, I don't see menace on that side. On the other hand, when you have the federal forces uh, fire these so-called less lethal rounds, uh, that is dangerous. And we have seen that they have engaged in some attacks on protesters who have been peaceful. And, um, you know, but I, but I guess I would also say that I think that 
those protesters who are a minority, who vandalize federal property, who spray graffiti, who uh, attack the uh, those federal forces who are violent, I think that they undermine their cause. I think they play into President Trump's hands. I think they help confirm that uh, Sean Hannity narrative that this is a war zone. And, you know, to the extent that people downtown are talking about uh, uh, about Black Lives Matter, they it'd be useful to learn from Representative John Lewis, uh, the late John Lewis, and his deep commitment to nonviolence action as a as the best way to bring about change. What would happen if law enforcement stopped what they are doing, stopped meeting the protesters each night outside of these federal buildings? There are, are many people who believe that the people who you mentioned before classifying as a, as a minority of the group would follow through with some of the things that they have done so far when even to the point of burning buildings to the ground. So, I mean, there is a real problem with violence and unrest. We saw that earlier uh, in some of the uh, attacks on property that happened uh, after the George Floyd killing. So, I mean, there is no doubt that there is a real issue with violence in Portland. But the arrival th that was subsiding and then the arrival of federal forces inflamed it. It took a genuine problem and worsened it and aggravated it. And so I do think that uh, that Portland uh, needs to protect federal property, needs to protect the, the Hatfield courthouse. But, you know, Mark Hatfield was somebody who was deeply committed to working things out, to uh, nonviolence. And he would certainly want to protect that courthouse from people who might want to burn it down or uh, deface it. But I don't, I can't imagine that Mark Hatfield would be in favor of uh, clubbing a Navy veteran who tries to ask people questions, uh, that he would be in favor of firing a less lethal round at a man who's simply standing in the street. Um, so. It's going to take a while to diffuse the situation. It's going to take a while for the crowds to diminish. It's going to be a lot of work for Portland, I think. But the path toward resolving these problems starts with those federal forces uh, pulling out, I believe. Based on some of the things that are, are steering the narrative that people have based uh, on videos that we've seen online, uh, the Navy veteran you just mentioned, the uh, the protester who was holding the speaker over his head when he was shot in the face with a less lethal round, um, officers detaining or arresting people, or protesters, um, you know, rushing officers who appear to be in the middle of an arrest, things like that. Is it difficult to truly understand what's happening or to have an opinion when we're, we're a lot of times basing them on one-sided stories or short video clips of only a few seconds? In general, it's not a problem of the Portland protests. That's a problem of America in 2020. That, you know, years ago, a, a scholar at MIT wrote that the internet would bring us uh, a news product that he called the Daily Me. Well, today we all have the Daily Me. <laughs> we get, you know, we get news uh, filtered in ways that confirm our prejudices. And that's true on the left and the right. And so I think it's important to try to to try to escape our bubbles. Um, and, you know, I, I would encourage people to go out to downtown Portland and see for themselves. And um, I, um, you know, I, I think they may have a, a somewhat different view. And, you know, I'm, so, I mean, one thing that troubles me is that, look, <laughs> Oregon really does need federal help in one sense. I mean, there, there is a real COVID-19 problem in Oregon. Oregon needs federal help in getting test kits. It needs PPE. And yet the federal government has stiffed Oregon for providing that assistance, even as it provides these federal forces who, instead of reducing a problem, are exacerbating it. There are a lot of people who email me every night who think and tell me that the federal government is saving the day that the protesters are unruly, they're violent, that they stand out there, that they go to the courthouse, they provoke police until police act, and then they scream police brutality. What 
is you, uh, you've been out there, you've seen this. What would you say to those people who are writing me in every night? I get dozens of emails every time the show airs. I mean, look, there is an element of truth to that. There is no doubt that there are people in the crowds who are provocateurs, who engage in that kind of provocation. So the federal forces will respond. And that's, again, that's not a Portland issue. That's, I mean, I've covered protests like this in, I don't know how many countries around the world. And that is a dynamic that happens in all kinds of protests. And it is incumbent on the authorities then to find ways to diffuse the situation rather than to pour gasoline on top of it. And uh, when you have federal forces uh, present like this, you know, their very presence adds to the problem. And so I think it's perfectly fair to criticize some of the protesters for violence, uh, for provocations. Um, but what is going on right now is not helpful except perhaps for President Trump's re-election campaign. Talk to me about your experience and what you've covered many different types of uh, protests around the world, as you mentioned, within countries that were run very different ways and they were over topics uh, that varied as well. What parallels do you see and what, what things do you see here that make you especially nervous? So in general, um, protests like this tend to be youth driven. And that's certainly true in Portland that especially late at night, uh, the people uh, there tend to be uh, mostly young. And there tends to be a dynamic in which people um, taunt the authorities, they go closer and closer, and it tends to be a small group of people. Um, you know, in the West Bank, it's people throwing stones at the Israeli Defense Forces. In South Korea, it, during the, the fight for democracy there, it was uh, uh, attacking individual uh, South Korean uh, police. In Poland under communism, it was attacking the Zelmo riot forces. And so there's always going to be a contingent that, that engage in those kind of provocations. And there's invariably going to be a certain amount of, uh, of unrest and chaos and, and, and violence, and it's not going to get to zero. But sensible authorities all over the world look for ways to build bridges, to um, reduce the numbers of crowds, to uh, find ways to um, negotiate a, a, a decline in the, in the heat of the situation. And um, in Portland, that arguably was, having, was happening until about a month ago. And I think the opposite is happening now. And again, I just, you know, I really don't think this is fundamentally about bringing security to downtown Portland. I think this was an effort by the president to pursue his reelection by presenting himself as a law and order candidate, because that's a better narrative than one involving the coronavirus. What makes you say that? Why couldn't it be both? Couldn't it be a well, promotion for his campaign as well as a true care for law and order and for property and business owners and, and things of that nature in Portland? So, I mean, I, I do think that uh, the business community, which has often backed President Trump, is you know particularly concerned with issues about uh, protecting um, uh, businesses and stores, and was uh, you know deeply alarmed by the violence that happened in Portland against uh, against some of those businesses. But businesses also tend to be practical and pragmatic. They want to get back to opening and making money and they want to have the streets safe. And, you know, what we've seen here in the last few weeks as Portlanders know better than I is not Portland returning to normal. It's larger crowds turning out uh, each day. It's more confrontations, uh, more tear gas swirling through the streets. And so if you look at the practical question of how Portland get back to normal, this is not it. Um, you know, before we before we we end uh, here, I, I just you mentioned that the where you think the narrative is incorrect when it 
you take the national eye looking at Portland. What should the people around the country, you know, when you write for the New York Times or when you're speaking to a larger audience than just the people here in this city or in this state or region, what do you think they need to be watching for? What do you think they should be paying most attention to? Well, of course, I'm biased. I think Oregon is God's country. Um, Portland is kind of the periphery of country. The very epicenter of it is Yamhill County, of course. Um, but I think that um, it's important for the country to remember that what we're seeing is mostly unfolding on, you know, in a couple of blocks in downtown Portland, in particular after about 10 or 11 p.m., and that this is not affecting the safety or well-being of the great majority of people in Portland. And that, you know, there are absolutely legitimate with security in Portland. And, and there were businesses that were attacked. Uh, this was deeply damaging. Um, but that the problem was on the way to being uh, ameliorated and now, unfortunately, it's on the way to worsening again. A lot of people, including the mayor, have said that it, it was dying down. Um, what, have, what have you seen to show any kind of like analytical data or proof to that? Because as far as, as I could tell, it was still relatively common every night that there would be some type of confrontation and some type of fire that would be lit or some type of uh, vandalism that would be happening pretty much on a nightly basis, leading all the way up to federal involvement. I, I mean, I think that's true. And uh, you know, every evening there were these confrontations and there was, um, while we don't have data on the number of participants, I gather that the numbers were on the decline. And that, I mean, that kind of makes sense with what one has seen elsewhere in the world that that uh, people have us to do, uh, movements tend to lose momentum when they, they don't cast a spell. Uh, and in this case, that new, that, that new cause uh, came when the Federals came in. So it, I wouldn't, I could say, it wouldn't, uh, but I think it was subsiding. And then something new happened and uh, that work was undone. I'll end with this. Where? How does this end? You know, um, I think it's going to be, I, I think it's going to be a long road, and I, um, I, you know, I, I fear that uh, the Trump administration is going to be reluctant to draw forces. That that uh, indicates that they made a mistake or that they're surrendering, and. And uh, indeed, the Trump administration is now in a similar contingent to see uh, President Trump has said that the federal forces have done an extremely good job in Portland. And so I think it's unlikely that they will be removed anytime soon. And in them, I think there are going to be more and more Portlanders. Turned. I'm afraid that, that this is going to drag on for some time uh, unless it becomes manifestly clear in the polls that the strategy is working. And in that case, there'll be some new uh, Washington to distract us all and point us in some new direction. Thank you so much, sir. I appreciate your input and your thoughts as always. Great to be back in Oregon.